We are in, as you can probably see, a fairly wet and miserable Westminster today. Just four stops away from the, the sunny city of London, but in a place that can at times feel like a world apart. The city in Westminster, they do speak different languages, they move at different paces, and they do have a slight tendency to rub each other up the wrong way. I'm Charlie Conchie, Chief City Reporter at City AM, and in our new series, Bonds and Ballots, we are going to be looking to unpick the ties between Westminster and the city, look at what makes them tick, and look at how both sides of the political debate are looking to win round UK business and the city ahead of a general election. In a moment, we're going to be heading into the Treasury here to speak with the man in charge of the city brief for the Tory government, Bim Afalami, to hear what he has planned, what the troubles are in the city at the moment and what we can expect in the year ahead. So let's head in and find out what he has to say. Well, Minister, thank you very much for joining us. First all, of all, good morning. Our first guest on Bonds and Ballots. Um, thank you for having us in. Um, I wanted, if we, if we could, to start with a bit of your, your own career journey. We were walking in here today. It's quite an ornate setting, and it feels sort of quite a far cry from the glass and steel of the city where you started your career. Was that a, a difficult transition to make going from the square mile into government? Good question. I mean, just give a sense. So I studied, you know, uh, history at Oxford and then I went to be a corporate lawyer and I started at Freshfields um, where I trained and then I did a year as an associate in the corporate team. I did lots of um, private M&A and, and that sort of thing. Then I moved to Simpson Thatcher, which is a great US firm where I did M&A, but also a lot of capital markets work. And then after three years at Simpson, I switched to go and work in strategy and restructuring at HSBC where, you know, and then I got into parliament. Now, the thing about political careers, as you'll appreciate, is you can't plan them. Uh, obviously, I was you know, committed to the party and I've been a member of the party for a long time. And I was sort of you know, doing all the things that people do when they want to become MPs. But it was the snap election of Theresa May. And I just turned 31 years old. And then I was elected to replace Peter Lilly, um, who was a you know, Conservative Party legend who used to hold this office. Um, in fact, the office that we're in now um, in the 1980s. And so I was obviously very privileged to do that. And then when I was in Parliament um, via all sorts of jobs, I did party jobs, I did PPS jobs to senior ministers, and then was appointed by a prime minister uh, a few months ago to take up this role, city minister, which it's, it, it's, it's such an honour because I, a lot of people, as you will appreciate in the city, know me, they've worked with me. Uh, and then when I was in Parliament... I very much worked on a lot of these issues as well, so I was very familiar with the with the issues that that I'm that I'm now dealing with. Do you? I mean, do you find the ways of working very different there? Often, you know, we have what we call doers or so in the city. Do you find the machinery of government at times? Do you miss the private sector and the ability to just get things done when you want to do them? The truth is, uh, very big private sector organisations are quite slow and bureaucratic as well. Uh, uh, but government can be, there's no doubt about that. What I would say, if I were to describe the differences, is I would say in the city, there is a always a clear focus about what the organisation is broadly trying to achieve. And though there are different departments and whatever in, 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 in any business you're in, in the city of any size, that focus is held to pretty strongly because they're sort of run like mini autocracies to some degree. In government and in politics, it doesn't work that way. And so a lot of what you have to do is persuade and cajole. Now you have to do that in private sector as well, but in government, a huge amount of time is spent really explaining to people, persuading them about your point of view, your department's point of view, what you're trying to achieve, and try and bring all that together so that you're rowing in the same direction. And that takes a lot of time. And it's actually often the reason why government's bureaucratic. It's not because of inherent sort of slowness. It's because you have to spend a lot of time squaring people on what you're trying to do. I mean, uh, this new podcast we just launched here is all about, I suppose, the interaction, the understanding between Westminster and City. Do you think that at times that, what you've just described there, is lost in the city? Do you think there is a sort of misunderstanding of the, the cajoling, as you put it, and there's some frustration? It may be a misunderstanding, but it's frankly a frustration because sometimes governments were able to work very, very quickly. So Silicon Valley Bank, when it had its troubles, and you'll remember this very well, the government pretty much worked over a weekend, and that was largely dealt with. So I think in the city, what you'll often hear from people is, well, when the government really wants to, it can work very fast. And they're right about that. But what I would say is you can't operate as an emergency all the time. 
one of the things that we need to do, and it's very much in, in my brief, and it was something that I was working on in Parliament before I was appointed to this, is you know, we have independent regulators uh, that quite rightly are independent and they need to do their job. But you've also got government, you have Parliament, you have industry. And making sure that all of those things are working the same direction to the right agenda is a really important thing for us to do. And I know how frustrating it can be for the city when they see one bit of that going in, in what appears yeah. to be a different direction from other bits. So I think one of the jobs that I have is to make sure we bring all those together, make sure everybody's focusing on the same thing. And again, I'm, I'm one minister in the Treasury. It's a very important department, but you know, across government, you'll have lots of other examples yeah. of that sort of thing. I, I couldn't help but notice we're in your office today. There yeah. was a, a chunky Nigel Lawson biography on the desk over there. Lawson, um, Lawson was a great man in lots of reasons. And look, everybody knows that. But the thing I would recommend about that uh, autobiography, and look, I, I have, um, for avoidance of doubt, I have no financial interest in the Lawson family or his autobiography. But the thing I would mention about that is Nigel Lawson was a journalist before he went into Parliament. And so he can write very well, but also he can write concisely. And that, though it's a very big book, each chapter is divided into quite very small subchapters. And you can really go and look at a bit. So, you know, I was interested in the Big Bang and how he thought about it in the mid 80s. And I just looked up in the index, Big Bang, go in there and there's sort of seven or eight pages on the Big Bang. This is Most autobiographies, you don't get a chance to do that. I was going to come on to Big Bang. So is that a sort of philosophy you're still aspiring to as the city minister now? Do you think that is you well, know, something we... Because of the work that he did, that legacy means that we don't have to do a Big Bang in the same way. But Big where Bang I... Big Bang 2.0 is... Well, what I would say is... I think it's important that we have a capital renaissance, is how I've described it, which is a rebirth of British capital, a rebirth of British ownership. And that's what our reforms are designed to help kickstart. I mean, if we just do come on to your brief now, you know, you've been in the role since November, probably, unless you want to give us a scoop now, a year ahead of an election, you've got a year there to work in the brief. With some, you know, as you've touched on there, some pretty big challenges facing the city, facing UK financial services. Is this year really going to be enough to actually make meaningful steps forward there? Do you think we could actually see some progress in the next sort of 10 months, 11 months? So 2024, I see as the end of one thing and the beginning of something else. The end of what has been a three, four year legal and regulatory reform process which started really with Jonathan Hill, Lord Hill's listing review, but there've been lots of other reviews after that. Um, Wholesale Market Review, Rachel Kent's Research Review, various other things. So it started with Jonathan Hill's work and it's continued. And this year, by midway through the year, we really would have not just said, not just commissioned the report, not just said we're going to do and legislated for, but actually put into practice um, the bulk of what we're doing. So far, we've delivered 22 of the 31 reforms we set out. By mid-year, we're going to have a lot more that have actually gone through Parliament. And so I say that it's the sort of getting near the end of that process. But it's also the beginning of something else, which is the beginning of the process, whereby with those legal and regulatory reforms having been done, they're not the, the only thing you need to do. There are other changes we need to make. And those changes are underpinned by those legal and regulatory changes. In particular, what will they lead to? The changes we're trying to make are going to lead to increased investment in the British economy, increased ownership for retail customers. These are ordinary people owning stocks and shares. And so it's increased investment in the British economy, increased um, by retail, and critically, increased the size of our economy overall. And those three things are the guiding principles between the reasons for the capital renaissance. It's not just academics, not just because we want to do it. In the same way, the Big Bang is not, was not just an academic exercise for Nigel Lawson because he thought it was important. It was to result in real, meaningful change on the ground. That's what we're trying to do. You, you, sort of, you mentioned the, the three-year, four-year regulatory legislative process we've mm. been to. Is that part of the problem, though? The Hill Review, for instance, you know, we had recommendations in March 2021, it's now, you know, getting to three years later. Is there just a, a sort of culture, you know, of we move too slowly in the city? Does there need to be a sense of just get on and do it a bit more? I mean, as you all know from things before I was in this post, you know, I often expressed in Parliament 
frustration at the pace of certain things. But the truth is um, that in order to get really big things done, you have to think about them quite carefully. You've got a process that I think we can shorten overall, but you know, you've got a process of doing a review, thinking about what you're doing, legislating, secondary legislation, regulatory rulemaking, and then delivering. Is that a pro? I mean, is, do we need to look at that process? Then? Maybe, but ultimate, you know, legislation is, is yeah. legislation. And if the regulator didn't consult anybody before it put in its detailed rules, I'm sure you'd be getting phone calls from people in industry saying, the regulator's done this mad thing and they didn't even ask us. Do, do you see what I mean? So there is, there is a balance. And look, I, I am thinking about ways in which we can shorten that. But we are where we are. The clear trend of direction is there. You know, when I speak to people in the city, yesterday, for example, I was at Rothschild. This morning... Um, with the Chancellor hosting a breakfast for British bank bosses, you know, every single day I am speaking to somebody in the city. And all of them, though they will have their concerns about certain aspects, have their concerns about regulation, the need to increase the total investment, various other things that they have concerns about very legitimately, they all say they recognise the importance of the legal and regulatory reforms we put through. The job now is for those things to underpin the real meaningful change that we need to see. Can you, I suppose, give us a sense of, you know, the mood in the room this morning then with those bank mm. bosses? What's kind of on the agenda? What's keeping them busy at the moment? So I think that the broad atmosphere was, first of all, recognition that this is a chancellor and a treasury that really wants to, to, to improve the, the economic prospects for the sector. I think that, that recognition was clear and stated by everybody. I'd say the broad concerns really reflect how quickly we can move a lot of these legal and regulatory changes. I think that's, that's a fair point for a concern. Um, questions about the, how, how carefully we coordinate the regulators to make sure that we're, we're all rowing in the same direction and that we aren't seeing governments say one thing and the regulators do something else. And I think we need to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then a broader focus on how can we increase the amount that the banks can invest in the British economy and think about ways in which to do that. And I mean, can you, any solutions there at the moment that are being thrown around? What's your... I mean, we, we are, you know, this is part of quite an intensive phase of dialogue in order to do that. Uh, but what I can assure you is that the Treasury, Downing Street, the regulators, the industry is all on the same page of recognising the importance of this and also recognising that there are lots of different aspects to the issue, and some of them are structural, particularly when you think of, for example, the capital markets, the public markets, London Stock Exchange, Aquis, AIM, etc. There are some structural issues there um, that are just beyond necessarily the reforms that we've done. On, I suppose, structural issues in the public markets at the moment, are you, you know, confident that those are being remedied by the the sort of mm. regulation tweaks we're seeing going through. Do you think there is a deeper almost sentiment issue there? Do you think people have soured on London? That's going to be maybe well, a harder thing to shift. The, the, the truth is there's been a huge shift toward private capital over the last few years. So since 2017, the growth in private assets held privately has been 20% each year, right? So what you're globally, that's a global number. So in essence, your that is what's happening generally. Fewer companies, fewer people are, are, are going public in the way that we, you know, people used to 30 years ago. At the same time, what there was a concern, and I think that's why we did a lot of the legal and regulatory changes, that there were some of the rules, there were frictions in the, in the London market. And that's why we've made a lot, so many of these legal and regulatory changes. But, and it's important to recognize this, the two fundamental issues, one of which is the need to increase the amount of capital going into the UK capital markets is something we are very focused on. This is pension funds and... Yeah, it's just, you know, and there have been structural changes, particularly around pension funds now having a sort of global allocation model, which basically means the UK being a percentage of the global GDP, that amount being allocated to the UK, that didn't happen in the past. So there are, and that's a lot of the work we're doing with pension funds, which is saying, how can we get them? And they say they want to invest more in the UK, right? Public and private. So that's one aspect. The second aspect we need to fix is the retail participation. Over the last 15 years or so, the percentage of individuals 
who owns shares has sort of halved, right? Now, we need to reverse that. One of the ways in which we're going to reverse that is, you know, and I'm leading on the NatWest share sale, which the Chancellor announced at the autumn statement we're going to take forward at some point in the next few months. You know, that, that I hope, will be a bit of a moment for sort of British, UK PLC uh, as to making sure that we have a very strong offer for ordinary people to own one of the great British banks. I think that's one thing. But the second thing, which is technical, but does really matter, is the European regulation on MIFID II really destroyed a lot of the research into small and medium-sized businesses that people used to need to rely on if you're going to invest in them, because you haven't heard of, most people wouldn't have heard of any of these businesses. The review that Rachel Kent has done into that is really important so that we can get research going again, which will improve the investment going to medium-sized businesses. And the last thing I'll say, just to address the structural point around the shift towards private capital, which is a global shift, by the way, and it would be a mistake for me to tell you that that shift will stop or reverse, is something that we're calling, we, we call the intermittent trading venue, but what I'm calling Pisces. And I forget what the acronym is. I sort of messed around with the acronym a little bit to get there. But, the, but to call it Pisces, which is, a way of allowing private businesses to access capital markets for periods of time. And that is something that nobody in the world has. And if we can get this right, if we can be the jurisdiction, we can be the country that allows private companies to be able to raise money from capital markets and to bring those at, with the appropriate safeguards. And by the way, the regulators are very involved in, in how we design this for the, you know, for the avoidance of doubt. But if we can be the first country to do that, that is a huge prize because that is the magic source, bringing private and public closer together. It's very important for me because regardless of whatever you think about, you know, the need of public markets on London Stock Exchange or whatever, if we do not have really strong retail participation, what that means is ordinary people don't get to own shares in this country. And I think that's a real shame. The, I mean, on the retail side, the, there's an apocryphal tale, I'm sure you've heard it in the city as well, about city boss goes to New York, the taxi driver talks about his stock portfolio yeah. in the cab. Do we have that culture in the UK? Because, you know, you've you pointed to some of the statistics there about share ownership. Yeah. It's been on the decline. We just don't really have the culture of retail so, investment, so do we? You know what? I used to, I used to think that. Uh, and I'll say what I was doing last night. Uh, I was with... Um, the Crypto um, Business Council, Crypto Asset Business Council, at a reception, I was speaking at them. And six million people in this country, overwhelmingly you know, under 50, own a crypto, crypto assets. Uh, when I was in a pub in Hitchin in my constituency, the barman who I was chatting to, he was talking to me about the crypto that he held. The reason why I mentioned crypto, and by the way, we are we're in the process of regulating stable coins following, and, and we will continue along that process because I think it's important that we do regulate crypto appropriately to actually incentivize more investment, not to diminish it. Uh, and the sector wants us to do so. But parking that to one side. The reason why culturally this matters is we haven't lost the energy of wanting to own assets. We haven't lost that, particularly younger people, is that they haven't seen the traditional, in inverted commas, the traditional markets as somewhere where they can do that. And that's one of the things that I want to change, to say, don't just own crypto, own a share in NatWest. Don't just own crypto, invest with your savings through automatic enrollment, invest in Britain, the British stock market. That is the shift that we need to see. It's not the, the, the cultural thing can actually weirdly be a bit overblown, because actually I think people are keen to do that, but they just don't see our traditional markets as a way they can do that. So that's one of the things that we need to change. There's a, a good quote from the boss of Aquis about making equities sexy again, which I think is, seems to be a lot of the challenge. Um, but I was keen just to come into some of the wider politics of the city at sure. the moment. Um, you know, it's been a fairly tumultuous two years. Do you what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we saw sort of traders and, and banks slightly baffled by the decision last autumn under Liz Trust. Do you think that, I suppose, the confidence has been irreparably lost? Do you see yourself fighting more of a battle now in the city with your opposite number, Tulip Sadiq? No, because there is absolutely nobody, regardless of their political persuasion, who doesn't see Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt as very strong, stable custodians of the city, right? Uh, no, not one person said that to me. Uh, everybody knows these two people in different ways complementing each other 
are the sort of very, very strong anchors for the city more broadly. And I think that what led by them, the broader government and me following behind them have been able to do is to give that stability, but also show that we do need a shift towards a more pro-growth, less risk averse culture. You know, and I've said at the FT Banking Summit, which was, um, I think it was my first public um, intervention in this role, you know, there's no point us having the safest graveyard, right? So I think that what we have is, is the right balance and we just need to now keep going along this track. Do you, do you find it frustrating though, you know, you're going and having sensible conversations about growth, about boosting the growth yeah. of the city, and then it's slightly blown off course by some of the, you know, more extreme conversations around immigration where, you know, businesses need talent, they need people coming into the country to grow. Do you find them at odds with each other? Are you having to often sort of apologise and excuse some of those sentiments? No, I haven't. Um, I don't think, I mean, look, people have different briefs in government, right? If I was the immigration minister, I'd be spending a lot more time talking about immigration than I am. Obviously, I'm not. So I think that when I see and speak to people, there is obviously a broader political conversation as you get into the, as you get into the last year of a parliament. I mean, that's normal. And there's always that, thought around investors saying, oh, what's going to happen and, and this, that and the other. The thing I would say, which is most interesting, is that the, the Rachel Reeves and, and her team haven't really opposed any of our reforms. This isn't, you know, we, we have got, the, and the reason why isn't because they wouldn't want to score political points, and I'm not making, you know, I'm not having a go at them. It's not because of that. It's because they know that the industry recognises them. They know that we need a sensible outcome. And I, and I just say to people who are listening to this, that shows the broad consensus that we've been able to lead on this issue, pushing for that more pro-growth, pro-innovation mindset that I think you know, has been lacking in recent years. I think we've allowed the pendulum to go too far into a sort of you know, taking risk out of the system in every conceivable way and, 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 and allowing that to, to dominate. Actually to say, look, if we want to grow our economies, if you want to go forward, if you want to do new things, if you want to lead the financial services sector, if you want the financial services sector to invest more in the UK, we are going to need a mindset that leads in that direction and not to constantly be in the space of saying we have to stop every, every conceivable risk coming because that will damage uh, our economy. Um, just finally, I imagine you know this this building is very much shifting into budget mode now. We're in the yeah. you know weeks before a budget. We saw government borrowing figures this morning, recording on Wednesday, you know, lower than expected in December. Is that more tax cuts to come, do you feel, then? Is it, you know, can the city expect a few sweeteners there as well? What's the... It wouldn't be an interview before the budget if you didn't try and get me to give a budget announcement, which I would um, uh, uh, get shot for. Uh, all I will say is that um, is, uh, nothing's agreed till everything's agreed. We're not there yet. The Chancellor will, will make his announcements. We'll wait and see then. And just finally, hopes and wishes for the city in the year ahead. What's your big sort of themes, predictions of the year to come? I think that by this time next year, we're going to see a city that, where the capital markets are bouncing back, where there is uh, increased investment in the UK, where there is increased retail participation led by the NatWest share sale, but not just that, in this country, and a British economy that continues to outstrip Every single year, uh, the observers, the, 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 the forecasters appear to be wrong on the downside. A British economy that continually outpaces them because we've made the right reforms, we're doing them the right way. And the financial services sector, and I want everybody to know this, is an integral part of delivering for the people of this country. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, I'm sure there'll be lots of fingers crossed in the city. But Minister, thank you very much for joining no us. No problem. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our latest episode of Bonds and Ballots. Let us know any thoughts in the comments below and make sure you click subscribe here to stay up to date with the latest episodes every Friday morning.